Old Sword Club weekly live stream. Um, I still don't really have a good name for these, so weekly live stream is kind of the best um, I can come up with. Uh, but anyway, today we're looking at various guards because I realized a little while back I have this bad habit of teaching everything from the medium guard because it's easy for me as an instructor and then not actually saying, point, um, teaching any of the other guards and getting a bit um, surprised when my students all turn around and be like, hey, all we fence from is the medium guard. So um, these are a bunch of the other guards you can fence from. I'm going to sort of cover what you can do from them very briefly, but really don't think of this as a conclusive kind of, you know, word of God on each of these guards. It's, well, for what I'm very much not a God or a master or, you know, anything other than just like a dude who is basically the HEMA equivalent of a dungeon master <laughs> in D&D. Uh, but, you know, take this as an invitation for any guard that you find interesting um, and to then go and experiment with it in your own fencing. So go out and, you know, just try the different guards out. Be like, oh, what happens if I, you know, start in um, in cart? What happens if I, you know, I, I start in tears? What happens if I, you know, start in second or the old hanging guard or whatever? Um, you know, the, the point is, you know, it, it's, this should be the start of a journey into experimenting with different guards rather than, you know, the uh, me walking you more than the first step. So, yeah, I, this metaphor, I didn't really think this metaphor through, but uh, thankfully I did think this lesson through. So we'll see how we go. Anyway, I'm just going to whip my jacket off and jump on up. Um, and grab my trusty, trust me, demo, demo saber. All right, so as much as I said that, you know, I wasn't going to, as much as I said I wasn't going to, you know, rehash the medium guard too much, I'm going to start by just reminding everyone how to form a medium guard, not because I, well, basically the reason I'm doing this is so that you've got, an easy, you've got an easy position to then form the other guard from. Like I said, the medium guard is a great starting position. Um, and, <coughs> um, but you know, when, as you get more sophisticated in your fencing, you probably want to use the guards. So to start off with, just, um, you know, start at attention in this kind of slope sword position, take your offside foot, your off foot. So basically in terms of sword terminology, sword side, offside, offside foot, put it behind your sword side foot. And you want to form a straight line between uh, your heel, your two heels and your toes. Um, and then from there, you want to move your feet till they're about two foot widths apart and bend your knees comfortably enough that when you move back and forth, your head doesn't bob up and down. Um, I've sort of covered this in previous lessons. So if you're not already sick of me here, uh, sick of me saying this, you know, describing this process, go back and watch the other lessons and become annoyed at me, I guess. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so yeah, but feet comfortably bent, two foot widths apart, thereabouts, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter. And then with our backhand, we bend at 90 degrees and just rest it on our hip, make a fist and punch ourselves in the hip. So we're just resting. With our front arm, we bend it at about 90 degrees so that our forearm of our sword side is roughly horizontal. I think mine's not exactly horizontal, but it's close enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Then we then bring our sword tit up to about um, about the same height as our shoulder. Um, and we form the medium guard. So the idea, with, the idea with having it at shoulder height, you might need to have it a bit flatter with a much longer weapon or a bit steeper with a much shorter weapon. Um, but the idea is basically from this position, I can snap out and cut without actually having to move my tip backwards or move my tip anything other than forward, but I can also thrust, again, not needing to bring my tip back. And that's medium guard. You are now a little teapot, both short and stout. Right. And just because I'm going to go over them um, during the course of the lesson, I'm just going to quickly run through the cut angles. Um, and you can follow along as a bit of a warm up, if, especially if you've done it before. But uh, the seven cuts that we're going to be using are one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So yeah, so for this cut one, I just extend out. So my sword is 45 degrees pointing 
um, pointing to my sword side or pointing past my sword side. Drop down to cut two, I bring it up to 45 degrees, go up onto my offside or past my offside, bring it straight down, cut three, turn over and come back along the same line, swing around to cut four, and just whip up the same line I used for cut number one, cut five, I come horizontal, put my sword pointing away, pointing past my sword side, and swing across. Then for cut six, bring my sword horizontal, it pointing to my offside, and just whip it across. And then for cut seven, just drop it vertically down. So just a reminder, I'm gonna to switch to my stick, uh, just because it shows up a lot better on film, um, especially with you know the, the dark windows behind me. So for cut tar, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right, and let's just practice those in our own time once more, just so they really set in. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And back to guard. All right, cool. So that will fire it up and ready to go. Let's look at some of the different guards. So the guards, for the most part, um, are numbered the same as the by hand position. Um, I think you've covered previously the difference between a guard and a parry is in a guard, if I'm in a TS guard, my tip is at shoulder height, is facing my opponent so I can quickly thrust them and high enough to quickly cut them. With a parry on the other hand, uh, my, tip is, my tip is high, is further over, so either on the center line or even as far over as the other side of my body, depending on the length of my weapon, um, to cover me because the goal of a parry is to stop a blow, whereas the goal of a, of a guard is to provide a platform where you can throw different attacks, different defenses, um, you know, different you know, motions from, uh, whereas a parry, you know, if, I need, if a parry position is not good to counterattack from, I will just move to a guard position before throwing my attack. It's not, you know, a parry needs to be a defense first and foremost. All right, so let's start with the first of the guards we look at, which is prime, because I'm going to go through my numbers. So from our medium guard, all we do is turn our hand over, put our hand either on the center line or even in line with the sword side of our body, depending on the length of our weapon. Um, but we want our tip, want our tip, you know, fairly firmly over. In fact, we probably want the forte of our weapon to be, um, you know, to be in line with the offside of our body. So this doesn't, you know. This doesn't need to be drastic. You don't need something as drastic as this, um, because my body is bladed, so you know it's not, and I'm fairly and I'm fairly thin, fairly bearded. But the goal of this is to primarily to pre protect my high end side. So in the same way that I make a prime parry um, in this position, I make a prime guard, probably with my ended. So I still want my tip out as a threat, so that way if my opponent does do something spicy. All I need to do is lunge forward. Uh, so this is done. This guard is also done with the arm extended, unlike most other guards where the arm is retracted. The reason being is this is incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly ineffective. So yeah, this is our prime guard, also called the hanging guard, uh, the old hang, the hanging guard or the old hanging guard. Um, I'll talk about the what, what's termed either the low hanging guard or just the hanging guard in late 19th century Britain later. Uh, but for now. Call this either a prime guard or a hanging guard. The terms can be used interchangeably, and I'm going to use them interchangeably um, because I thought I'm like a person. So, advantages of this guard: um, what is I'm protecting my head. I'm quite covered. I'm also, you know, and also um, doing this, especially against someone who's not used to it, will make them feel like they want to go low, which is great because I just pull my leg back and hit them in the head as soon as they um, try and hit me in the leg. Um, Disadvantages are pretty much anything I do is going to come high. So uh, this is actually this is a really good guard to use if you're the sort of person who instinctively raises their hand when they go to cut. So if you know, instead of punching straight, you raise like kind of arc. Starting the hand guard basically stops you from doing that, which is good. Um, the attack I throw is probably going to be high. So I'm not, I don't have as much versatility in my attacks. To go low, I'm basically going to have to reposition and then attack, which not only 
um, you know, is predictable, but it also gives my opponent an opportunity to, um, to counter cut me. From here. Uh, the other disadvantage you're gonna to see tonight is when you have a low ceiling, um, just it can be a bit difficult to avoid hitting the ceiling. So I don't like using this one primarily because I fence in this room quite a bit with my family um, and friends who come over and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I've tried to avoid any guard that causes me to swing high. Uh, but it is a pretty, otherwise it is a pretty good guard. This, you know, certainly was a stable guard in the Napoleonic era. Um, from here, it's, cuts are fairly easy. So throw cut one, just turn your hand over, cut one position, then sweep down, and then sweep back up. Same deal with cut number two, flick my hand down to the cut two position, hand goes down, and straight back up. Cut three is a little harder because I basically have to withdraw my hand a little, show you that from the side and come back. It works a lot easier with a stick where I can throw a false edge cut. With a true edge cut, I'm basically opening myself up to a counter cut. Um, cut four from here, I have to draw a circle or do a moulin A to throw it. It can be pretty sweet, um, especially if you do if you cover this with movement. So if I'm moving around and my tip is already drifting back, I'm already moving my tip to threaten my opponent. That can be quite sweet and quite quick and can catch an opponent in the ways, especially if they're also in a hand guard. Uh, but, you know, generally the staple, um, any of the, you know, cuts five and six, fairly easy. I just move to the cut. No. To get to the cut five position, I just mullin my sword around my head, just get my stick, then flick across, cut, uh, cut six, just move to the cut six position, flick out. And when you do as a smooth movement, it's pretty quick and flicky and quite nice. Um, and then cut seven, come to the cut seven position. Usually, you can usually do this with a much higher hand um, without hitting your roof. But you do want to be careful. You don't want to do that if your opponent's in a. If I'm facing someone with a medium guard, sure I can throw a cut seven with a high hand. If I'm against someone who's in like a me who's in a medium guard or a tier guard, throwing with a high hand is vulnerable to get me counter cut. And that's why you know you tend to want to throw descending cuts quite quickly, or quite high cuts to you know just to basically attack in absence. So let's try. Let's actually try throwing some of those cuts, and I'm going to switch to a shorter sword. I should switch into a buffer so I don't damage my roof because that is a risk here. But from prime, so cut one hand, cut one position, throw cut one back to prime. Cut one hand position, throw, back to prime. Cut one hand position, throw, back to prime. And cut one, cut one, cut one, cut one, and cut one. This is also a fairly, and you can see here as well, it's very quick for me to get back to this position, which makes the, um, like makes sort of the hang guard or prime guard a really, really good guard to retreat under. So if I'm, you know, if I need to get the hell out of dodge, if, you know, don't know what's going on. I can go to a prime guard and just retreat. Um, and there's a lot. And Hutton actually says that you don't necessarily want to lie in um, a prime guard or a hang guard, but what you want to do is move to it um, after you've cut and before you, before um, so that you're covered to see what your opponent is going to throw back at you. So let's try cut number two. So I do move to the hand position for cut number two, throw the cut, and straight back up. I'm getting down to here. Bring my tip across and raising. So cut position for hand number two, down and back up. Hand position, cut, raise. Hand position, cut, raise. Hand position, cut, raise. A little bit fluently, but you know what? Let's just do it fluently. So cut, 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 and cut. All right. Now let's look at cut number three. So again, cut number three is not a very good cut to throw from this, but sometimes you might. Sometimes people won't expect it. But all you do, well, cut number three, is you rotate your sword. And you rotate your sword back, so you flick your tip up, bring your sword back, and raise. And then when you get to this position, just turn your hand over. So again, sword goes over, cuts, and back. Over, up, and back. Over, up, and back. Over, up, and back. 
one of the things Sutton says about this guard is that it's very, very tiny on the arm, which right now for me it is. So yeah, yes, over, up and back. Um, the main time you do this honestly is, a, is as a is off the back of a displacement, like you might have parried prime. You might do this to you might do this because your opponent is pulling their sword high, and you want to have a crack at their either arm or come up under the chin, like that. Not the best in low ceilings. All right, now let's look at cut number four. So cut number four, I'm already kind of in the position. Cut number four, and just raising my tip up isn't going to really have much force. So what I want to do is draw a full circle, do a full moulinet. Um, and when you're thinking about like how to, when you think about moving between hand positions, so um, uh, Graham Chapman, who was a great foil fencer um, in Victorian Britain, his idea or his way of simplifying French foil was he said, right, all you really need to know is the hand positions, um, all eight of them, and the different ways you can move between them, whether via disengage, cut over, derobement, um, etc. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a really, really efficient way of thinking of it. But you can do the same thing here where you can go, right, well, each cut comes from a different hand position. Um, and then there is obviously the hand positions of the guards. But then you have different ways of moving between them. So I can, you know, throw a direct cut, you know, just move by moving my hand directly forward, hitting, um, and my tip just comes directly forward, or I can throw a A. Um, and that can be a horizontal or a vertical Moulinet. So the vertical Moulinet, I draw a circle with my tip. I don't want to do this um, necessarily because it's very, very telegraphic. Whereas doing this where I throw a circle, yeah, okay, it is telegraphic. Not as bad. There are a lot of faint options that I'll cover later. But it has the advantage that you can use this to displace your opponent's sword as you come in. So, yeah, you can, uh, so when you're trying to work out how to cut, go right. Can I cut with power if I, with a direct extent by directly moving my tip forward? If the answer is no, then go right. Is it is it convenient to throw a Moulinet? Like just draw a circle with my tip to come back to that position. Which we see here, the most convenient way to do this is to throw a vertical Moulinet. Just draw a circle with my tip. That's my cut number four. So vertical Moulinet, vertical Moulinet, vertical Moulinet, vertical Moulinet, vertical Moulinet. And vertical Moulinet. Right. And as I mentioned before, there are also horizontal Moulinets. It's where, you know, I throw, I basically do this motion with my tip. I draw a horizontal circle and throw, you know, and just throw um, a cut after drawing a horizontal circle, or more of like a question mark shape, I guess, with my tip. In the case of the prime guard, you do this for cut number five, where I do a horizontal Moulinet. And just come across. So horizontal one A, 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 and horizontal one A. Right. And then for next, for cut number six, it's a very abbreviated, it's basically kind of an abbreviated vertical one A. I draw the one A to come to the sixth position and cut across. And it's a very, very small circle, but it's a circle and less, so up and bang. Six, cut six, cut six, cut six, cut six, and cut six. And then that same kind of vertical Moulinet idea that cut, comes across with cut number seven, where I just throw straight down. So I'm, again, I'm drawing a circle and just dropping straight down and coming back up. Straight down, straight down. Straight down and straight down. And those are how to throw each cut from the guard. Let's now look at defenses. So um, obviously there are a lot more barriers than there are cuts. Um, you know, not just because there there's there is at least one parry for each of the eight, eight hand positions, but of course with things like cart and tears, you have three parries for the one hand position. Um, you know, octave and septine, you have two. Uh, prime, you have two, although you're not going to throw a prime parry from a prime guard, or very unlikely to. Second, you gain two. Uh, then with six and six, or five and six is the only hand positions where there's one parry. Actually, technically, with um, uh, Quint, the fifth hand position, there's no parries in Saber. It's just a hand position you need to know more to understand how to move your Saber through space. So 
yeah, Quint gets a bit neglected in this, I'm afraid. But let's have a look at which parries are most useful. And if I'm in this high guard, the most obvious thing to do is just drop my tip down. And I can come down, I can come down. You know, I basically bring my, whatever's gonna come at me is either gonna come at, is gonna come at two heights. Because of how high I'm holding my hand, my hand, the chance of something coming in the head height are pretty slim because my sword's already in the way and I wouldn't actually have to move. So that means something's either gonna come in at torso height, at body height, or at leg height. And so with torso height, there are, there are two things I can do. I can drop into a parry of low second if it's to my outside, or I can drop into a low prime if it's to my inside. All right, so let's start by looking at second. So all I do is bring my hand down, and from the prime position, from the prime guard, all I do is bring my hand, uh, my hand down to about level with my shoulder, because I'm using a short weapon, I want, to, I want my sword to be pretty much um, vertical. You might want a bit more extension if you've got a longer weapon. Um, but yeah, all I'm doing is dropping straight down to protect myself. So let's try that a few times. So second, 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 and second. All right. So now let's move on to what is probably a slightly less intuitive parry, but still a really, really useful one, which is a parry of low prime. So from here, what my opponent might try and do is come in underneath my sword, and they might even try and put direct pressure on my on my sword tip um, as a way of getting control of my sword to come in and hit me, you know, somewhere in the, on the inside, on the inside, like maybe about here-ish or so. Really anywhere from sort of the armpit down. Um, so what I want to do is again bring my tip down. I want to bring my hand over for this, weirdly enough. And bring my hand over and just drop it down. And sometimes, I actually find it's a good cue when you're practicing, is to let your tip drift back to the center line and then come back to the edge of your body. So you're, drawing, you're actually bringing your tip in an arc. And the reason is you want to make sure that you don't come down and actually bat your opponent's sword into you. And if you draw, you know, if you draw a little arc with your tip as you're coming down, you're never going to do that. Um, so when we practice, what I want you to think about from coming to from uh, the guard, of, you know, the guard of prime to a low prime parry, is circle tip, circle tip, circle tip, circle tip, and circle tip. No one's more luck. Circle tip. All right. So those are the two main parries where something comes in. I can just drop, like I can just drop my tip down. And if I'm dealing with something like a thrusting weapon, so I'm against someone who's got like an epee or a bayonet, I just come straight down to second. It doesn't matter where they're thrusting. This will sweep everything aside. And if I've got good control of distance, I can even use like, like a weight shift or a small retreating step to basically come down and just smack anything out of the way. You know, the big advantage of this guard is I can just drop my, something comes in, I can just drop my sword on it to knock it out of the way and then create an opening for a high riposte. Um, the problem is if something comes in too low, it can be very, very difficult to deal with. So if someone comes at my legs, I can't necessarily get my sword down in time. And so I just, I'm just not going to bother. You know what I'm going to do? If someone comes at my legs, I'm just going to pull my foot out of the way. I'm going to slip. So the other defense we're going to do from here is slipping. So all we're going to do is jump up, basically pull up so our feet are um, bolt upright, so we're, you know, leg straight. And what that does is it bounces our feet together. It means we can move very, very quickly. So we're, we're not just pulling our foot back. Um, we're also, we're essentially jumping up in the air, jumping without our feet leaving the ground. So from here to slip, slip, slip. Slip, slip, and slip. All right. And so yeah, with this, uh, if you've got a, like a partner to experiment with with this drill or with this guard, one thing that's a really really useful drill to do is get them to throw um, one of three attacks, either one at your um, inside chest, on your outside chest, or one at your leg. Doesn't um, one at your leg? Start off with the same attack to the leg, and then start varying the leg attacks. So they get used to responding the same way to leg attacks. 
and you just do the right defense for each to get a sense to help build a sense of where things are or like where things are coming and what parry to use. All right. So what are the other advantages of this guard? Other than the fact that you're starting high, um, you can throw a lot of high attacks, you're very covered and the guard is very intimidating um, and your defense is to some degree simplified. Um, I mean, beyond that, like you are, you know, I think the biggest advantage to be honest is that just, I can just drop my tip and sweep. And if I'm prepared to slip or just move back a little with my attack or with my defense, sorry, you know, I can kind of just knock anything coming in aside. And if I'm really aggressive about it, if I'm really, you know, really kind of create, you know, drop down, I can even sweep things past my body, which can leave my opponent quite open. So I think that's a big, that's a really, really cool thing you can do from um, a prime guard. Other than that, um, like I said, if you're the sort of person who instinctively raises their hand to attack, the best way to, the best thing to do to stop yourself from doing that is just to start high and come down. And I find that even is kind of, it's almost orthopedic for getting people to put their hand in the right position. Um, and on that, like a lot of new, a lot of new people, particularly, tend to find this a really, really intimidating guard to come up against because it looks like you can't hit your opponent, um, but you know, obviously you can. Um, but it sort of it does throw it throws particularly new people off if they haven't seen it before, which is kind of nice. All right, I'm just going to quickly check if there's any questions. Looks like that's no. If you do have any questions, just chuck them straight into the chat, um, or chuck them straight just or comments or whatever, depending on where you're viewing from, um, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. But they'll stay up there. All right, so let's look at the next guard in our series. All right, and that's a con. So from the medium guard, I raise my, I turn my hand over, I bring my tip and my hand in line with the outside of my body. And I point probably I want my tip just I want my tip probably level with like you know my nipple height. It's quite extended, so I'm like this. You know it's quite a you know it's quite an extended, quite an aggressive guard. But I'm protecting my outside, so you know um, this is as a guard. It's kind of a good kind of prime equivalent if you're facing someone who's left. If either if you're facing someone who doesn't use the same hand as you, so if you're left-handed facing your right-hander or your right hand facing left hander, this is a better option. Doing prime guards against each other means that you're not properly forming opposition. Whereas if one of you throws out um, the guard of second, you've probably formed opposition and you also have the advantage that you're going to push your opponent quite like quite far out past your body. It's quite good. Oh, name of the guard is second. So second or second. Um, this is also the guard that John, Ma John Musgrave White wrote. Uh, uses. It's quite good. It's quite aggressive. I find it's like a more aggressive prime. Um, yeah, it's much like it's a more aggressive prime guard than prime. Um, I don't like it necessarily against saber, uh, against like saber or cutlass, but again, particularly against other weapons or against people doing um, different systems where they're using like withdrawn guards and things like that. It's quite nice. Uh, certainly, if you've got someone you know who's in the guard of the determined from um, Baville, going into second um, and aggressive and just pointing your sword at their hand is quite effective. It's quite nice. Um, so from here, the cuts are really quite similar to prim the prime guard. Yeah, I just turn my hand over. Um, I find pretty much all of the from here, all of the descending cuts are done on a full moon. Um, and John Musgrave Waite says when you're cutting, you have to really, really make sure you don't pull, you don't bring your hand back in the slightest. He's very worried you'll do this, which will give the game away. Um, so when I throw cut number one, it's just straight over and down. So one, 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 one. Cut number two, basically the same deal. Except I bring my tip to the other side, cut down and straight back up. Over the other side, down, straight back up. I'll show you that from the side. Over the side, down and straight back up. Over the side, down, straight back up. And important thing with these two guards is I find particularly from Sakon, you can do this with from Prime as well, but it works a lot better from Sakon, is doing this Moulinet, which is very, especially if you can get it very non-telegraphic, 
by keeping your arm, like keeping your hand forward, and your arm extended, um, it can actually be very, very diff. You can actually faint very effectively between cuts one and two. So I might throw, you know, a few cut one, you know, a few cut number ones um, or number one cuts at my opponent, and then come through with a cut number two. And because the angle is so slight until the last minute, um, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really, really effective. And if you've got a very, very long weapon, so if I'm using um, this thing, this is one. This is one of the few sort of things I can actually get to work with. This you can base because it's a bit slower in movement. You can basically hold off deciding which angle you're going to cut on until you're fairly extended and your opponent has reacted. And so, you, so you know, you can sit here and go, right, I'm going to throw, and we're like, oh, well, my opponent thinks I'm throwing a cut number one, so I'm going to throw a cut number two. Um, and it becomes a very, very convenient and easy fight, which. I am quite fond of. All right, so from here, cut three basically works the same way as with prime. Just flick over, form a small name, come back. Yeah. Just like prime. 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 And just like prime. Cut four, exact same idea. From here. Draw a circle and come back up. Circle and 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 up. And circle and up. And I find from second, uh, the cut number four is actually a really good primary attack. Uh, when I'm fencing from second, not that I do that terribly often, it's not my favorite guard, but when I do do it, I find that throwing cut number four is really intuitive and in terms of all of the um, all of the things that I want out of an opening cut, I actually find easiest to get out of cut four. Because I'll throw, and it's quick enough that my opponent can't counter cut or do anything fancy, but just visible enough that my opponent has to react to it. They can start getting my opponent moving so they can then hit them with something, which you know I'd usually do with like a cut one, um, or you know, for a medium, either a one or a two. Um, from second, I can do with a four, which has the added advantage that a lot of people aren't used to rising cuts, so it can kind of throw them, which is also cool. So, from second, cut five works basically the same as it does from the handguard. My only real advice is make sure that once you get to the cut five position, you're bringing your hand across. You don't want to do this because a canny opponent will slip back and catch you on the wrist. You want to get your hand across. Um, as a way of just protecting yourself. So you want to, once you get to the hand position, the cut position for hand number five, or the hand position for cut number five, has the hand on the opposite side of the body, on the offside. Or, you know, with this cut, at least leave the hand. Same deal with cut number six, um, but the hand's already where you need it to be, so you don't have to worry as much. And then with cut number seven, let's bring my hand straight. Same deal as cut number one and two, except it comes straight down. I find number seven is not as good from um, the guard of second, um, just because it's a bit, it's more, it's a bit more obvious what you're doing, but it also has the disadvantage of coming down the center line, so it's kind of going to get parried by whatever your opponent throws. Whereas a cut one can come around. Um, a TS guard or like, you know, I got um, one of any of your normal outside guards, a cut two can come around any of your normal inside guards, a cut seven is going to get caught by both. So yeah, second, not so great for cut two. All right, so yeah, I'm not going to go over the cuts just because I want you to focus on how the mechanics are the same. So maybe try and visualize how you would do the movement you did when we were doing the prime guard, but from second. Um, so I think that's a really, really good exercise in terms of getting you to understand how to move between hand positions and how the hand positions are the same. Um, much as I know it annoys some people when I'm like, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to do it because it's more fun to work it out for yourself. And yeah, this is, this is one of those situations. But you know, a couple of days, you can actually fight me in person. If it, if it annoys you, you can come and hit me in person if you want to come up the mountains. All right. So in terms of parries, uh, second. You know, you obviously have the same kinds of parries you have for the prime guard very easily. Your head is more vulnerable though. Um, but one of the advantages you have from second is you can pull up to this head guard position quite easily. 
So, you know, your primary parries are on second, low prime, and head guard. Um, in order to get to low second, you draw a circle with your tip. You don't want to come directly down uh, necessarily because that can ca you can get caught in your opponent's sword in a way you don't necessarily want. Whereas you draw a small circle. One is when you actually do this, you're when you actually do this, you're going you're going to abbreviate the circle, but that's what you want. Uh, whereas if you practice coming straight down, it's very very easy to practice coming down wide. So from here to go from the guard of second to the pair of second, draw a circle and cover your body. Circle and cover. Circle and cover. Circle and cover. Circle and cover. And low second. Low second. Low second. And low second. All right. With prime, it's very easy to just go directly there. You're basically bringing your tip down on this diagonal line here and your hand across. So down across, down across, down across, down across. Uh, incidentally, you're bending primarily from your elbow, or well, probably primarily from your elbow, um, more so than kind of crunching your shoulder, but the movement is slight enough, it really shouldn't matter. So just second to prime, second to prime, and second to prime. And then for the head guard, um, for the head guard, I'm wanting to pull back to this position. So my elbow is not really moving very much. Um, I'm just raising my hand up and putting my sword in front of my head. I actually want it to be mostly level with my forehead. You can have it lower or higher, depending on a lot of different specifics. If you've got a shorter opponent, you can. If you've got a shorter opponent, um, you can actually have it lower because the angle they come in will, will be will be steeper. Um, against a taller opponent, you're probably going to want it a bit higher just to be safe. Um, yeah, the, the parry positions are a bit approximate anyway. So from here, head guard, head guard, head guard, head guard, and head guard. This is a really, really good kind of quick, you know, really quick kind of all shit parry. Um, one thing I found I've seen people do, I've never done this myself. Uh, but I have had it done to me, and I can attest it is effective, is from, well, this kind of position, is come in with a head guard low. So, you know, especially if you're against someone who is taller and is inclined to throw slightly higher, which, you know, being taller, is, that's one. Of, that's really one of the only things that taller people will reliably do is, natu is naturally throw a little bit higher. Um, what you can do is say, right, Unless I see their tip go backwards or their tip go backwards for rising cut, they're going to throw some variant of up, some variant of sort of chest up. So from here, you squat down, you step in, and you come in under the cover of your sword as a way of chasing them down. That can be a very, very effective way of chasing someone down because, you know, if you've gotten lower than your opponent so that your forearm is no longer vulnerable to an angled attack, like anything is going to come in high. The head guard will protect, at which point you can chase your opponent down, come in quite aggressively. So it's yeah, one of the advantages of second is it's a really neat guard to do this from. Um, and the other advantage as well is because engagement from engagement in second is quite rare. Like you basically have to be very, very narrow in front of your opponent who is also in second and is committed to engaging in second. Um, what that can mean is that anything what will mean is that your tip is essentially in absence um, until then. So what you want, um, so you know, pulling your tip across or sweeping your tip across to come to this um, head guard position will essentially sweep through the entire high line. So you can kind of, you can actually just go right. <laughs> I've got a not a universal parry, but as close to as you can reasonably get. So that's kind of one of the cool things you can do from second. Other than that, I find with second, it's quite good for um, you know these kinds of feints. Um, I also find that because I don't need to bring my hand laterally across my body um, as much as I do with prime, it can be quite nice for um, it can be quite nice for sort of these feints where you know I threaten high and come low. So from here, threaten high, 
come low or come rising. So the idea is I'm getting my opponent to react with a high parry or a high defense, and depending on what they're doing, I'm either then going to do a rising cut at their sword arm or um, under the chin. So that can be quite cool. So simple, high, low, high, low. There's a bit of a trick to this as well, is I lean on the high cut, this very jerky movement, and I lunge on the rising cut. Um, and when I lunge, I'm specifically thinking of thrusting my hips forward to make up for the fact that I'm leaning forward otherwise. So high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. And you notice as well when I do this, I'm coming, I'm never coming past this kind of vertical position because I don't want to get my sword caught on my opponent's sword because that's going to give them a lot of feedback and it's going to make it a lot harder to throw the feint. So I come to vertical and then rise. Vertical, rise. Vertical, rise. And vertical, rise. All right. Cool. So next card we're going to look at is TS, which is one of my favorite. It's also probably... It's a really common guard. It's one of the most common in the period. Um, so second is quite rare. Um, the main person who uses is John Musgrave Waite. So if you feel like, if you enjoyed second, if you're like, hey, this feels really cool, check out John Musgrave Waite's what, uh, manual because he does a lot from there. Um, Tears, on the other hand, really freaking common. Everyone loves Tears. <coughs> Sorry, my throat was getting quite dry. Um, Hutton even says that when you're fighting, you're probably going to be fighting out of the medium guard or out of a TS guard, one of the two. So, form a TS guard, my medium guard, turn my hand over to TS and let it rest in line with the outside edge of my body. My tip stays on the center line, my tip stays forward. It's literally the smaller movement. Um, but it does make a bigger difference because I've now got a lot more leverage and resistance against anything coming to my um, to my high outside. If something does come in, I can just lift my tip into a tears parry. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily have to. I can also extend into a tears thrust if I want to get a counter thrust in. But, I mean, to be honest, if I'm in this position, the chance of being attacked on this side very minimal and probably only, it's only going to happen if someone's very, very new. Like even people who haven't done 19th century stuff, like if you've got, like if you're fancying someone who's done a lot of medieval um, or Renaissance era stuff, they're still going to go, okay, that line is closed. So from here, attacks are pretty much the way we throw them from the medium guard with one exception. So cut one works exactly the same way. Cut two on the other hand, feels a bit different because I'm not actually changing the angle of my hand when I'm extending. Um, and what I'm instead doing is just punching out and whipping. Um, if you remember my cane workshop from last year when I talked about um, tip slashes, this is the exact motion. This is pretty much the motion for that. Um, and so yeah, I'm going to, so mostly, to, so when I'm covering this, you know, cut three is the same, cut four is the same, cut five is the same, cut six is the same, and cut seven is the same as they would be for medium guard. Cut two on the other hand, so which is the one we're going to look at, a little different. All I'm doing is extending, whipping, and retracting. Just extend, whip, and retract. Extend, whip, and retract. Extend, whip, and retract. Extend, whip, and retract. Two, 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 and two. And I find the reason why I'm bringing this up is I know it's fairly intuitive. It's just a bit. Okay, a little, little different to how you'd normally throw it, but not a lot. The reason I bring this up is because it really exemplifies the way you, know, you punch um, when you cut. You can't, like, you can't really hack from here. And actually, this is in doing cut number two from um, a TS guy, it's a good way to learn to get this kind of punch and whip motion where I punch my tip out and then whip it down for my cut. Punch and whip. So yeah, in terms of um, technique, I find it's not that much difference to medium guard, uh, to be honest. I do it because I find it a bit more comfortable to sit in.
doesn't change my tactics at all. Um, the one thing it does do is it mean it makes it a lot easier for me when I throw a cut number one to come in to get around my opponent's tip and to come in with a slightly smoother cut number one angle. So a cut number one is a little bit better. Um, and it also means that I've got more of this kind of cut over motion. Um, with a medium guard, there's a tendency particularly to just kind of flick out and extend, which doesn't generate a lot of power. Whereas from TS, uh, if you remember the horizontal Mornay I mentioned, you're almost doing that by default, even if you try not to. Um, not that you would, and that generates a bit of extra power. So uh, to be honest, if I had to use a saber to defend my life, I'd probably defend out, fight out of a TS guard. Um, because I find from here this attack is a bit more powerful and just a bit more reliably going to disable an opponent. Um, other than that, uh, the only real difference is that you to do a TS power you need to raise your tip. But going to the cart position is basically the same. Um, oh, the other thing is actually low prime is actually quite low prime can be a bit awkward from here. You want to uh, you basically want to draw a circle outwards with your tip and come back in because otherwise there's a tendency to do this where you scoop your opponent's sword into you. So if you're in um, TS and you want to do a low prime parry or really any time kind of prime parry, circle round um, and come. You want to circle round and come to it. Like circle, see how I'm drawing a circle. I'm actually letting my tip drift out past the line of my body and then coming up. Um, and yes, that is, and that's going to abbreviate when you fence with this. But what that's going to mean is you actually do, like, you don't drag your opponent's sword into you. Um, you know, you, when you practice this, you're probably giving a bit more space. You're probably circling a bit more than you wouldn't about. But I think it is also important to remember that the way you drill, the way you do a technique in a drill, not necessarily the way you can do it in about, very unlikely to be exactly the same in about. And really, you should be drilling your techniques to make you do. You should be drilling your techniques in a way that makes you better at bouting, and then slowly start and then start merging your drilling technique and your bouting technique. Don't try and drill the way you bout off the bat, because what you'll find is that means that you do techniques perfectly and drill during the drill, and horribly during the bout. Um, which is also what, another reason why I'm making people wait um, until they can drill perfectly to bout um, is just is a really bad idea. It doesn't work, does not make educational sense. All right, so from here, um, I mean, pretty much all this, the tactics are the, same, are the same or very similar. Um, I find the one advantage is if I'm in a medium guard, I'm going to be, I know I'm going to can be attacked either high, um, on either side. In a TS guard, I know I'm going to, I know that I'm going to be attacked um, on the inside or low, um, and low I can defend by slipping or by moving, um, and it's also a bit more obvious because my opponent's going to have to drop their sword or start in the low guard. And if they start in the low guard, I'm taking the offensive and having got them. That's where this sort of punch card comes in actually quite nicely when you get opponents who start in sort of low guards um, because they're looking, um, because they're hoping to threaten the, the low line more effectively. If their sword goes down, you go for their wrist, basically. Um, and the TS guard does that kind of snap much, much better um, than medium does. The medium guard is good for quick snaps to the sword arm. The TS guard is good for quick snaps to the head, the arm, the buttocks, uh, depending on your opponent's facing, if you're lacking the drawing for comedic effect. Uh, when you do that, you need to yell boink. By the way, I don't know why, but you should. Um, but yeah, it's TS guard. It's kind of like a me. It's fairly similar to medium. So if you're used to fencing from the medium, you're probably not going to find that different. A guard you will find quite different to the TS guard is the cart guard. So all I do for this from my medium guard, keeping my tip on the center line, hand over to this angle. And sit it in, and sit it in line with the outside of my body, and this now basically is once upon a time this was thought to be the inverse of uh, the, the TS guard. So whereas the TS guard covers the outside, the cart guard was thought to cover the inside in exactly the same way. And which one you picked just depended on what your opponent was doing. 
the problem with this guard, I'm going to I'm going to start with the problem and then go to solutions. Uh, the problem with this guard is that you can see my sword arm is quite extended. It's quite far out, but it's also quite vulnerable. So if you can go to a cart guard and snap and just bring your tip up and snap quite down, like just disengage over and hit, you can crack someone in the arm in the sword arm quite easily. That isn't to say that the cart guard is a bad guard, you know, is a bad guard that you should never use. Um, but for me personally, my primary use of the cart guard is to get other, you know, if I know my opponent is defensive or if I've got someone who likes to wait and see what I'm doing before they decide what they before they react, I'll go to a cart guard hoping that they'll mirror me, which a lot of times people do because they want to engage, at which point I crack them on the sword arm. Straight in. Um, on that, I mean, it is the inverse of TS in the sense that, you know, cut number one is my snap cut, cut number two is my horizontal Mornay cut, you know, cut number three and cut number four work fairly similar. Um, I find from here, cut number three is actually quite, not, is a little easier because my hand is already over in position. I can just whip my tip around. It's probably worth practicing actually. It's from here. Just whip your tip around, whip your tip around. And you know, so I'm keeping my hand on the same side of my body, just because I find that kind of loosens things up a little bit, makes it easier to throw the cut number three. And then yeah, from here, uh, so cut four is pretty much similar. Cut five is actually quite a nice snappy cut as well. You can kind of ride up quite quickly into someone's head um, with that, although I've never actually done it um, because you need a lot of speed, which means a lot of vigor and, and um, Inspiring, cracking someone to the side of the head can be really, really unpleasant. So um, I'd only ever do it with a boffer, and I've never actually done it with a boffer. So yeah, this is a good hypothetical. And then yeah, cut six basically works the same way as um, cut two, and cut seven works exactly the same way. Um, advantage of this, one is it's good for baiting people into, um, or it's quite good for baiting people into letting them in their forearms be vulnerable. Um, and I think you do need to fence out of it to, you do need to fence out of it as a way of um, learning, to, like learning to deal with it. Um, if you're against a um, if you're against a left-hander, or if you're against someone with off sense, or if you've got, if you're left-handed fighting someone who's right-handed, getting them to going into a tier guard to get them to go into a cart guard can be a really, really good way to snipe their forearms. Um, other than that, I find, other than that, it can also be very, very good for baiting. So particularly if your opponent's standing away, so that they can't just they can't hit you on the forearm for extension on an extension, going to a cart guard can kind of be a good way to lure them forward. And then from here, I actually find high, um, going to an octave parry really, really helpful. So you know, my opponent is far enough away that they can't they can't just hit me on extension, but they're thinking, hey, I can get to his forearm on a short lunge. They do the short lunge, I draw a circle with my tip, raise my hand, and come straight back over. So come to Octav and straight back over. Octav and 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 over. So yeah. The other area they find this. Uh, cart guard quite useful, weirdly enough, is um, a few times I've actually done anything with terrain, with like obstacles. Um, and what I find is when you're going through a door, so just open this door, um, in spite of the fact it's raining, if I'm going through a door, I don't want to just walk through the door because there might be someone hiding behind the wall who can hit me. So what I do is I adopt a cart guard, I place it on the door frame, and actually walk around and I keep contact with the door frame as I'm coming around and basically checking the room if there's an opponent because that means the door frame is protecting me on one side and my cart guard is protecting me on the other um, and I find it's really really good for that so yeah it, I've only done this a few times but um, yeah in terrain it can be quite, it's quite a useful thing just as a way of basically protecting you that way and I just thought that was kind of an interesting side Otherwise, it's not a particularly good guard, um, and you don't see. Once you get into the mid to late 19th century, you start seeing it less and less. Um, 
you see it earlier. You, you see it earlier in British sword fighting with um, broad when they're doing broadsword stuff with an extended hand. So an extended hand, the forearm is a lot less vulnerable. It's still vulnerable, like more so than any other guard, but it's a lot less than when it's retracted. Like you, how much of my forearm can you see now versus now? Um, so yeah, it's it's not a bad like well, it is kind of a bad guard, but it has its uses, um, and it's also very, very good for baiting people. Um, and something Hutton actually talks about when he's saying, you know, if you've got an opponent who won't attack, create a false opening that you can take advantage of. And if I know that my opponent is very likely going to go for my sword arm, so let's say I've backed up a little bit, you know, I know it's going to be a very, very long lunge to my body, so I'll have time to react. Um, I can actually use that to then just go, right, if my opponent does a thing, I don't need to wait to see what it is. I just reflexively go to I just reflexively go to tears and counterattack, or even tears and thrust. I'm just going from a cart guard to a tears guard, and then tears guard and then thrusting um, as a way of basically baiting a counter thrust because I know that my opponent is going to be coming in with a fairly vertical seven thrust that I can get good opposition against and run them through the head. So yeah, that's cut. All right. Um, cool. Just check for comments. I'm just gonna have a quick sip of tea to keep refreshed. Yeah. All right. So last guard. Um, there are other numerical guards like Hutton talks about engaging in six. Um, you can engage in octave. It kind of sucks. Same with septine. Quint's a bit interesting um, because yeah, it's not. Doesn't seem like a guard engaging, but this is the guard. You know, this is a guard in Vaville. This is a guard in French counterpoint, and you'd get similar effects from Quint, where you could just sit here. Anything comes in, just strike down on. Just basically, bat out of the way and come in. Um, but the main guard I want to look at is probably the in late nineteenth century is the other real is one of the two most common guards. Um, Basically, which is the uh, low hanging guard or the engaging guard, it gets called both. Um, so the most common guards in late 19th century British sword fighting are the tears guard and the engaging guard. So to form the engaging guard, from, again using medium guard as a place to start from, um, and certainly as much as it doesn't appear in a lot of Seder manuals, a lot of Saburas in the period were being familiar with the medium guard because it's actually an adaptation from foil fencing. So this is the guard you start with in foil. Um, and as much as Hutton start, d teaches his saber from this, um, I suspect a lot of why you don't see it in most saber systems is they expect that anyone who's doing saber is already fairly familiar with foil and has kind of moved past it. Whereas Hutton, as much as he says, you know, you should be familiar with foil, he his system's actually really, really accessible if you're not. I'll just have to go quick on this. Oh. Um, do you ever incorporate um, a sidestep with a guard or parry? Uh, short answer is yes. I mean, with I mean certainly with the cart guard, I want to protect myself in a cart guard. If I'm moving um, sideways towards the sword, it's a little bit harder to snipe my arm because I'm moving away from that side. Uh, conversely, if I'm moving the other way, if I'm traversing the other way. I'm also moving myself away, which means my opponent's going to be on this side of me, which means, yeah, they're less likely to snipe. And I think also this is probably why you start to see less and less of the cart guard as fencing gets more and more linear through the 19th century. Um, yeah, but pretty much anything can be done with a sidestep or a traversing step. Um, it's just the cart guard. Um, probably benefits the most from traversing because that makes it a bit harder to snipe the forearm. Um, yeah, no problem. All right, so engaging guard. So from my medium guard, I move my hand up to be in line with, um, basically in line with the outside of my body. I bring my tip forward degrees like this. It's not extended like, like guards normally are. It's down, it's across. Um, but I slope, it's sloped fairly far across my body. So I've basically created a line that's divided my body into high and low, I'm engaged. I'm engaged in engaging guard or a low hanging guard, whatever you want to call it, and I've come to this position. 
And this parry, this guard is super cool. Um, it's super duper cool when you're facing something that's not a saber. Um, against an epee or a bayonet, or like a spear, I guess, like a thrusting weapon, I have now divided my body into the high and low line. Anything that comes in is going to come in either low and be parried down to second, or high and being parried up to high prime, and easily parried up to high prime. And the other cool thing is the closer I get, the more sure I am of where it's going to come. So, uh, let's see if I can improvise something up here. This is, you know, I'll just turn this into like an improvised, <laughs> a very, very weird home renovation show. All right, so I have a spear. I'm going to put the spear, um, add a bit of an angle on my weight box, and just getting my weight sick. It's going to fall off. All right. All right. So, I hope you can see that. There is a spear, it is roughly pointed at me. All right. If I'm back here, I've engaged. I know the spear is going to come in low or high. I can parry low or I can parry high, and I've got a, maybe enough time, depending on how quick the person is with their spear thrust, to react. If I come to here, and you can see how I'm now touching the spear, I know the spear is going to come in high. The way I know that is the spear wants to come low, so the person wants to disengage it round, is, about, is the point where I hit them in the head, because that's how close I am. Um, maybe with a slight lateral step so that I don't walk straight onto the point, but you get the idea. Um, conversely, if they're already low, I know that they're going to come low and I can parry them to the side and come in. So I think one of the, and I actually think the reason for the, pre well, the reason why this guy becomes more and more prevalent during the late 19th century is there's a point where someone goes, hey, sword on sword just doesn't happen very often anymore. But sword on bayonet still does happen quite frequently, so why don't we optimize our systems for bayonet? And if you look at Tui, um, the system of William Tui that came first appeared in 1868 in the Navy and then was adopted into the infantry about uh, over the course of the next 10 years, basically was adopted by all the other armed forces. Much as I've criticized it for not being very, very good against sword, make, um, it makes perfect sense against a bayonet all the parries you have in the system are good parries for fighting a bayonet. These withdraw big cuts. You want to, that's how you want to, you want to do that against bayonet. If you parry and grab a bayonet, you want to withdraw to make sure that you're clear of the weapon. You're not going to get tangled up by the person, especially if the person tries to rush in at you. You know, the tendency to just thrust, to thrust from here in tears forms really good opposition against a bayonet. It also actually works quite well as a counter thrust and as an opening attack. Um, but yeah, I, I actually theorize that the reason why TUI seems like a really bad system um, when you pit it against um, other contemporary saber systems that weren't adopted by the military is because it's designed primarily as a saber or as a cutlass versus bayonet method. Um, yeah, so low hand guard has that of you know has the advantage against a bayonet or an epee or a spear or some other kind of thrusting weapon. Um, yeah, I've basically divided um, where I need to parry into two, and I can even do it aggressively. You know, if I've got a very, very cautious sort of epee fencer who's like not quite sure what I'm doing, and I've managed to get, and they've put their tip below mine, I just preemptively parry and come in. I just push them aside and come in. Um, so yeah, it's really, really cool for that. It has the same advantage against um, Sabre, you know, if I'm in this guard, I know things are probably going to come in high or low. Uh, the one exception to that is that parrying um, high does expose my forearm. So if something comes into my high outside, I need to par I need to parry tears, which can be a bit clunky. Um, you can kind of lean your body to bring your shell in the way if you're um, quick, but I've never actually pulled. I pulled it off in about when I was bouting, when I was trying bouting left-handed. I've never got it to work right-handed, um, but you can kind of cover your heart side by doing this and getting your shell on your shell on the exact line that the sword needs to come down to hit your forearm. Um, but yeah, I have the same advantage where otherwise, something's if something comes at me, 
if I if the sword's going to come in high, it's either going to come high and I can parry it with sort of prime or head guard. It doesn't actually matter as much which, it, or the decision as to which is more about what repost I want to throw rather than about where the attack is coming, because this will from here I can basically sweep up anything, or I might need to um, you know, very quickly come to a tier guard if someone's throwing to my high my high outside. Um, and then of course, you know, if they, um, they might also come low, in which case I can defend pretty much most things by coming to second, um, although I'm gonna have to retreat or at least cave my body in case something's coming in to my low end side so I can sweep past me. But otherwise that's not too bad. Um, the disadvantage of that is if I come to this guard and my opponent rests their sword on top of my sword, which if they're in a medium guard, a TS guard or a cart guard, they will do, I am going second. Anything I do, any action I make, will either get me choked up. So, you know, if my, my opponent has a sword here, I have to basically contend or get, you know, I basically have to bind, um, bind this sword and then attack, which of course means I'm taking, I'm taking two without attacking, which is dangerous. Um, or I basically have to accept that my, my attack is gonna get choked up. Um, really, really easily. Or alternatively, I could, th you know, throw something really. I could um, disengage and throw, but that leaves me leaves me vulnerable to a counterattack. So, if I'm going, if I'm engaging my opponent like this, and they've got a and they've got a cutlass or a saber, I'm going second. I am on the defensive because if I'm going first, has a very low chance of success. Um, but that said, like going defensively. I know where my opponent's, my opponent's only going to come to like, you know, my opponent's really only going to come to one place if I'm engaged. So I've got a huge defensive advantage. That's kind of the trade off. Um, cuts from here, exactly the same as prime, with the exception of the fact that all of a sudden, um, because my hand is on the center line or, you know, is level, um, I'm not, it's not high. All of my attacks have the same have the same chance or have the same advantage level of advantage. So if I'm up here, throwing a rising attack is very slow. If I'm down here, throwing a rising attack is as quick or as slow as it is from anywhere else. Um, in fact, it's probably about as quick or as slow as any other attack because everything's going to be done in Molin A. Um, so I'm not going to cover those again, um, but just yeah. Again, that's kind of if you can imagine imagine doing it the same way as you would from Prime, and again, that is a very very good thought exercise. Um, yeah, so those are kind of five guards that aren't the medium guard that you can use. Um, I think yeah, just fencing from them is quite an interesting experience in its own right. Um, these are of course guards from uh, 19th century British sort of play. They're also not the only guards that you see. They're just really the primary ones you see, um, the most common of which being the tier guard and the low hanging. Um, yeah, other than the, uh, there are certainly other guards and then when you get into things like French counterpoint, uh, particularly in the earlier 19th century with Verville, there's a lot of other guards that make things even more interesting. Um, yeah, cool. So before we move on, are there any questions? Gonna sit down. Fortunately, my foot's been hurting, which is gonna make fencing and exactly very interesting. Uh, really, yeah, I need to get back into the habit of like um, espousing historical facts during the sort of the are there any questions phase. Um, I'm gonna also go for Thank you, Nick. Well, so Nick doesn't have any questions, but I'm glad it made the other guards a bit clearer. Um, it's sort of, there's this whole really interesting interplay between guards that you get um, when you're using more guards than you normally would. So yeah, it's sort of, it is, um, yeah, it is kind of a really cool and sort of in-depth topic that unfortunately I can't really, is very, very hard to cover by myself. Um, yeah. I, I know I complain a lot about how difficult it is to teach 
a two per well, what is normally a two or more person activity solo, but I, I'm now going to start complaining even more because you know with the rollout of the vaccine, the complete elimination of COVID in Australia or you know, near complete elimination of COVID in Australia um, and you know, everything else, we're actually looking at, um, well, you know, we're going to be able to go back to in-person classes um, in the not too distant future, uh, which is going to be really, really cool. All right, well, there aren't any questions. Oh, my sound just dropped out then. <laughs> it always happens. Um, cool. So if there aren't any more questions, then we might as well wrap up for the evening. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, so normal sorts of things. Um, we are going to be meeting um, on Zoom after, you know, Zoom after this. Um, it's going to be short it's gonna be a shorter session tonight I'm afraid because I'm going to, um because you know I've got to get up quite early tomorrow for work I'm actually going into campus which is gonna be super exciting. Um and as always I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um certainly like like share subscribe um you know that kind of thing but also um if you do want to throw us a few dollars just to help keep covering our running costs that would be nice as well. Um, Doubly so because yeah we um you know would part or one of the things that's actually going to start costing us um when it, you know it's going to start costing us soon is setting back up so yeah um if you could that'd be not quite nice uh, but otherwise yeah I'm going to start get I'm going to get Zoom started but I'm going to keep talking here until I know Zoom has started um because yeah I um. I know, just it feels like the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, you can come and come and join me on Zoom. Um, come and join me for a chat. Oh, the other thing before I forget is this Saturday is um, what is becoming a more and more regular event, which is Mountain Blade. Um, mountain, as in you know the thing you make out of molehills, <laughs> um, which yes is a pun on the game Mount and Blade. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, that's a Saturday up in Katoomba. Um, so details are on our Facebook group and also on our website. Um, I can just probably might just link you to the website now. Just um, so that you will have it. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you can come join us in Mountain Blade, that would be awesome. Um, and yeah, you get to fence me and actually see some of this stuff in action and also see, um, also, you know, use the fact that I've revealed all of my secrets against me. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll just put up the detail, some details for um, where you find out more detail, more information about that should now be on screen. All right, cool. Looks like the Zoom session has started. So I will see you all next week, or well, I hopefully see you all Saturday. If not, I will see you next week, or hopefully even more so, I will see you in Zoom. Um, yeah.